Muy buenas noches en México, muy buenos días en Buenas impresiones, ចំពោះអឺគលគលទីមួយរបៀងប្រទេសអាមេស៊ីកូនៅ Hay ចឹងជាកាមួយស្រមស្រួលក្នុងការធ្វើកនហ្វរិនរបស់ជើងនេះយើងមានបន្តចូលអ្នកដែលបានចូលរួមនេះដើម្បីធ្វើជាសំណួ
UNESCO has undergone a large project of preservation and rescue of this site. And also Mexico has over 200 archeological sites open to the public from the main pre-Hispanic cultures, Olmeca, Teotihuacan, Toltec, Zapoteca, Aztec, Mixteca, Chichimeca, and Maya, to mention some of them, being the Maya, the most representative in the World Heritage List. And given the importance of its archeological heritage, both Cambodia and Mexico, here we need to imagine everything that is still buried and that needs to be unearthed in order to know it. This has been a topic and uh, for motivation for young archaeologists and their works are needed in order to enhance the value of these archaeological sites. I would also like to mention the importance of restorators who develop a very important task, which is as important as archaeology and has a lot of future for youths. More than a task, more than a profession, it's like a devotion where professionals put their service for the good sake of all the human beings and help us to understand where we come from and where are we going to. So it is important to be concerned for the future. And then I would like to return to the topic of water and emphasize the importance of underwater archaeology. Underwater archaeology is a category of archaeology. And we know that underwater archaeologists, besides contributing to history, they also contribute to the preservation of biodiversity. First, because water is their field of action and also because among the remains of all the underwater heritage that we find there are plenty of corals and other sea creatures living there. Both Mexico and Cambodia have ratified the convention, the UNESCO Convention for the Protection of Underwater Heritage. And they have joined all the works in order to improve actions tending to preserve in a sustainable way all the heritage that we have underwater and all the heritage involved to this. Along the maritime route of the silk, we know that between China and Cambodia, there are found crossroads that worked along the history for this economic interchange and the knowledge and economic and, and political heritage. And therefore, we know how important is that heritage for Cambodia. In Mexico, there is also a very important remains that we can find in the under the sea, in lagoons, seas, and cenotes, where we can find remains of waters, offerings, and other treasures that belong to our past. We know that underwater heritage is also susceptible of looting. And we know that the problem is present and we know what that looting represents in terms of loose for our heritage. We have uh, an opportunity now to allow to the assessment of this heritage. But we need to have all these works under professional assessment. Let's remember also Banco Chinchorro, Veracruz, Campeche, and other places with lots of underwater heritage recognized by UNESCO. And these are some examples of the underwater heritage we find in Mexico. I would like to finish this intervention talking about the Maya aquifer and to greet uh, the ex Mexican expert Guillermo de Anda and all the other experts here. To stress the importance of the Maya aquifer, we know the importance of this site in terms of cosmolo cosmogony and we now know that these studies about this project 
were so important for ancient Mayas. And now we are going to listen to the importance of this project in charge of Dr. Guillermo de Anda, who has discovered incredible findings in all this project. We have found uh, animal remains as well as some human remains. One of these is the most ancient human skeleton found to the date. This is incredible to, to think that present and future generations can know about these findings and therefore to also preserve the value of the water and all the heritage lying beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Frederic Bacheron, representative of UNESCO in Mexico. Thank you for your words and and we remember that there is another Mexican expert who is still representing Mexico with all those topics of underwater heritage. Now we're going to listen to the words of Dr. Pedro Francisco Sanchez Nava, who is going to speak on behalf of the director of the INA. Good evening. Good evening to all of you in Mexico. Good morning in Cambodia. Her, Your Excellency, Dr. Sacona, Dr. Pablo Rafael de la Madrid, Dr. Frederic Bacheron, Master Fernando Aceves, Master, Master. On behalf of the director of the INA, anthropologist Diego Prieto, we congratulate you for this extraordinary initiative that ends today, this first colloquium of archaeology and restoration Mexico, Cambodia. This colloquium had lots of very interesting journeys gathering these two countries who could be able to interchange data experiences and results through their greatly recognized works around the topics which are common for us, archaeology and restoration. Besides responding to the questions that Fernando Aceves did about the motivations they had to be devoted to archaeology. This memorandum of understanding celebrated between Mexico and the Apsara Authority of the Kingdom of Cambodia signed in 2016 focused this, its efforts to improve cooperation between both nations through their areas of specialty, fostering the interchange and the exchange of knowledge between sites that have, that have been included in the World Heritage List given their outstanding values. This closing seals a great effort of having overcome time, distance, and the difference in time not only because of the thousands of kilometers between Teotihuacan and Angkor or between Monte Alban and Preavija. This is a great achievement and a privilege to, that can be developed today, even though the world conditions are not the most suitable. And it's also important to stand out the work of the organizers to make these conferences possible in three different languages, Spanish, English, and Khmer. I would like to join the question of Dr. Nelly Robles, who said that the relationship between the Mesoamerican and the Cambodian archeological sites is suitable and necessary. Dr. Q Chan, also asked to, to give advice about how to incorporate more students for archaeology in Cambodia. 
And I also want to reaffirm the commitment of the National Institute of Anthropology and History through the Secretariat of Culture to reinforce these bonds. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Pedro Francisco Sanchez Nava for these words. And now we will ask uh, Dr. Pedro Rafael de la Madrid on behalf of the Secretary of Culture of Mexico to give us some words. Some words. Good evening. On behalf of the Secretary of Culture, Alejandra Frausto, I want to greet Dr. Pyung Sakona, Minister of Culture of the Kingdom of Cambodia. I want to greet her. Good evening to Dr. Sampu. Director of the National Authority of SARA, to the Authority of Preavigea, Dr. Sadi of the University of Fine Arts of Cambodia, to Dr. Pedro Francisco Sanchez Nava, Director of Archaeology of INA, in representation of anthropologist Diego Prieto. Good evening to my dear Frederic Bacheron, with whom this Secretary of Culture is working in many topics associated to biodiversity and to the generation of biocultural territories. A good evening also to Fernando Aceves and to Bertrand Lovejoy. I want to add that in 2016, a memorandum was signed between the INA and the APSAR Authority. And today what we have is the result of, of having the capacity to produce a dialogue between these two countries. Mexico and Cambodia are linked by a bridge of 15,000 kilometers, a bridge which is only able to cross when authorities but also archaeologists and researchers, universities, youths, and teachers are brought together to reflect on these topics. Mexico and Cambodia are two cultural potencies with millenary traditions with a past that guarantees the future for each of them and with a great cultural richness that is that lies in the heart of its biodiversity this colloquium would have wouldn't have been possible without the participation and the organization of the colectivo tequio la buena impresión and i want to congratulate especially its members, as well as to the government of Cambodia, the INA, and also the participation of BBVA Foundation. If we summarize on what has been happening along these two weeks and around the analysis of materials, the excavations, actions of rescue and conservation of cultural heritage, if we think about what has been presented and the bonds between Mexico and Cambodia, especially after the weather, the flora that we can find in Cambodia and in the southern part of Mexico, and we understand the similar features. We know now that we have some common aspects that we share in terms of archaeological exploration and digging, and also in terms of the natural space where this archaeological heritage lies. Also, this opportunity is important to realize how these mechanisms are important in terms of cultural diplomacy. And I want to end saying that we are still facing a uh, hard situation, we have not overcome COVID yet, 
but this global experience have has taken us to sit around the fire in this case through technology to reflect on topics that are common for all for us now it is important to have given the call to culture the importance it has and to talk about topics associated to culture and generation of work and we need to speak about tourism which has been severely affected with the pandemics but now after a pandemics like this we need to figure out a new cultural space and this will be given thanks to these encounters and we need to cross the bridges every day but we need to focus on going back to nature and to our roots because the future has an ancient heart. Good evening, Mexico, and good morning, Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you very much to Pablo Rafael de la Madrid for these words, for all the organization of this colloquium, and thanks to him for representing the Secretary of Culture of Mexico. Now I will ask Pyrm Sakona, Minister of Culture of Cambodia, to give us some words. Okay. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Sus Excelencias, yes. Damas y Caballeros. Dear colleagues and friends. Eh, queridos and colegas. First of all, I would like to greet uh, Mr. Paulo Rafael de la Madrid. En primer lugar, deseo saludar al señor Pablo Rafael de la Madrid, representante de la Secretaría de Cultura de México, señora Alejandra Frausto y al doctor Pedro Francisco Sánchez Nava, coordinador nacional de arqueología del Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia de México. And Mr. Frederic Bacheron, representative Al señor Frederic Bacheron, representante de la UNESCO en México. Good, uh, Muchas gracias por sus buenos memorias y recuerdos y sus motivaciones de Cambodia. I would like to also my to the of Quisiera this expresar event. mi sincero agradecimiento a los organizadores de este evento que reunió a México y Camboya por una causa común. Es un gran honor y un sincero placer para mí clausurar el primer simposio sobre arqueología y restauración entre México y Camboya. Este importante evento fue posible gracias a la pasión del señor Fernando Aceves Humana por el arte gemer. Su encuentro con artistas y arqueólogos camboyanos de la Real Universidad de Bellas Artes despertó un verdadero deseo de desarrollar la cooperación entre México y Cambodia. Deseo expresarle mi agradecimiento por esta iniciativa que es fructífera para ambas partes. La distancia física entre nuestros dos países es de más de 15.000 kilómetros y la diferencia horaria es exactamente de 12 horas. Pero esto no ha sido una barrera para los organizadores de las dos naciones situadas en el lado opuesto del planeta. Aunque nuestras culturas son diferentes, los problemas a los que nos enfrentamos para preservar nuestros monumentos son similares. Me gustaría felicitar a todos los panelistas por sus presentaciones de alto nivel y calidad que abarcan todas las disciplinas de conservación y restauración, destacando específicamente el valor del intercambio. 
La investigación llevada a cabo por eminentes arqueólogos mexicanos en los diversos sitios de México permitió a los jóvenes camboyanos descubrir otras grandes civilizaciones como Teotihuacán, Monte Albán, el sitio urbano azteca de Ciudad de México, las exploraciones del gran acuífero maya y la ciencia de la conservación. Los arqueólogos camboyanos también quisieron compartir con sus homólogos mexicanos. Grandes yacimientos como Angkor, Coquer y Pravigea. Los arqueólogos mexicanos y camboyanos han demostrado buena voluntad al compartir sus experiencias y espero que esta conferencia, que esta, a este coloquio les sigan otros mientras los arqueólogos esperan poderse reunir en el campo. También he observado intercambios vibrantes e importantes centrados en las dificultades de la profesión de arqueólogo. Estos profesionales están animados por una pasión compartida que les ayuda a superar los obstáculos, sobre todo cuando se encuentran con descubrimientos que suponen verdaderos avances para su trabajo. La arqueología es esencial para la investigación, la conservación y la restauración, así como para la prevención en la protección de los sitios históricos y arqueológicos. Por último, expreso mi esperanza de que los arqueólogos mexicanos y camboyanos continúen su diálogo y fomenten esta importante cooperación entre nuestros dos países. Estas, estas relaciones ayudan a mantener un contacto muy importante entre los expertos en protección del patrimonio. And exploration on the Greater Mayan Aquifer. Thank you Esta very much. sesión de clausura terminará con la importante e interesante presentación sobre las exploraciones en el Gran Acuífero Maya. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Okay. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to Her Excellency, Minister of Culture of the Kingdom of Cambodia, Mrs. Fung Sakona. Now we are going to present our lecturer for tonight which is giving the closing lecture, lecture, Dr. Guillermo de Anda. Guillermo de Anda Alanis is underwater archeologist specialized on, in the study of mortuary and funerary rituals in caves and cenotes where he has worked for over 30 years. He holds a doctorate in Mesoamerican histories with and he's a diving instructor with more than 15 specialties, including cave diving. He is an emerging explorer of the National Geographic Society, fellow of the Aspen Institute Mexico, active member of the Mexican Society of Geography and Statistics, and head of special projects of underwater archaeology linked to the National Coordination of Archaeology of the INA. He has developed and directed several underwater archaeology projects in the Yucatan Peninsula, among these the cult of the cenote and the analysis of the human bones from the sacred cenote of Chichen Itza, with which he received in 2007 the honorable mention in physical anthropology of the Javier Romero Molina Award. He also founded and directed for 12 years the first underwater archaeology workshop in Mexico, at the University Autonomous University of Yucatan, where he was a professor and researcher. In addition, he has been speaker in more than 80 congresses and invited as a lecturer in more than 350 scientific, cultural, and educational events in USA, Europe, and Latin America. He is author of many articles and two books. He has participated and advised several documentaries and scientific materials with National Geographic, INA, BBC, NHK, TV Azteca, TV UNAM, Discovery Channel, History Channel, to mention a few. Today, Guillermo de Anda directs one of the most ambitious scientific projects in Mexico and in the world entitled The Great Mayan Aquifer. He has a multidisciplinary team of top-level researchers. 
where he with whom he works let's hear dr de anda good evening in mexico good morning in cambodia it's a great honor to be here with all of you today i respect respectfully greet all the authorities who are today with us this is impressive to be able to cooperate in this so important encounter i want to especially thank Master Fernando Aceves for organizing this event and for inviting me to this very important meeting. To all of you who are here present listening, also to La Buena Impresión, the Tecchio Collective, and we are going to start with no more preambles today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I am among very good friends, like Dr. James Brady. Who is professor of the State University in Los Angeles, and he has been a very close professional in my career. He is founder of the discipline of Maya caves. That's why he is so it's so important for me to have him tonight with us. And also Dr. Pedro Francisco Sanchez de Amba, with whom I directly work in the National Coordination of Archaeology. And of course, the Dr. Frederick Hebert, he is the resident archaeologist of National Geographic, besides being a very good friend. Fred is a great ally of this project. I also thank, thank to National Geographic Society that has been very generous with me with all the support and funds for research. And this project that I'm going to present is not an exception. Let me allow to share my screen with my presentation, which I expect that you find interesting. I would like to respond, first of all, to this question, why am I an archaeologist and why I decided for archaeology? It was a real passion since I was a kid. And let me tell you that since I was a boy, I had very important dreams when I was very young. This is the oldest I remember is that I was diving at home and my home was flooded and it was so nice to see all the water from the ceiling and this was a very recurring dream when i was a teenager i got wonderful books for of jules verne and then adventures of jacques Cousteau, and i found in archaeology the perfect way to channel all my interests that lately I discovered that was a passion to work underwater and especially in so wonderful contexts as those we have in the Maya world, this world of the cenotes, of which we have many and all of them are beautiful. And not just that, but all of them are real coffers with scientific information there is lots of scientific information and as monsieur Frédéric Bacheron said we are talking about thousands of liters millions of liters of water important for life and for the last at least 15,000 years this vital liquid has been basic in this place this was the sustenance for the first human beings that we now know that interacted in this world for during 15,000 years, during all the stages of the Maya civilization and during the encounter with the Spaniards. And in the Maya area, all rely on this resource. This is the the most important underground aquifer found in Mexico. It's not, not just, it's important not only in terms of biology, 
but it's also a large container of water, not salt water. And it's very important to preserve it forever. This is one of the goals of our project. When we look at a picture like this, we realize the wonders that we find below the earth in the Yucatan Peninsula. I'm not exaggerating if I say that this is the last frontier of exploration in the world after the oceans. We have this wonderful resource, which is not just beautiful, but it's a challenge for the human capacity for exploring and to survive with few resources, like two, three or six diving tanks or whatever we need to be able to go there, but it's a limited resource in order to be able to stay there. But this is wonderful. And this has given us the knowledge to know, to know and learn about the history, about all the biological resources in the peninsula. And this is also part of our investigation we are also in quest of the ancestral sources of water that I'm sure that have changed in the last thousands of years. These caves also gave origin to the rituals in the area and for the Maya religion. These are a wonderful challenge. This is like the Everest in the, ex in the research of caves. This project gave us the opportunity to link it with two great caves. One of them, the flooded cave, the largest flooded cave in Mexico that has thousands of kilometers of research excavation, and maybe in some months or years could become not only the flooded, the largest flooded cave in the world with more than 1000 kilometers. But speaking in terms of archeology, span which is my passion and the passion of many of us gathered here tonight, how all this began in this area, 36 years ago, some friends returned with a picture similar to this of a place called Kingha, where they found a stone that was somehow drilled by humans and that has charcoal inside. And for me, it was something to start investigating from because I realized that men had interacted with these caves before they were flooded. We can see that charcoal is the result of the combustion of wood that was burned in this place for any reason that we still don't know. But this was the outset point of beginning the exploration in this place when we speak about caves and cenotes. And let me emphasize a situation for ancient Mayas and for us, cave and cenote were exactly the same. Some caves had water and were known as cenotes. Some of them didn't have, but the symbolism and the importance of these sites was exactly the same. And they represented the same, the dark side of their universe which was measured in three layers, heaven, earth, and underworld. So I will mention cave and cenote, and they mean the same. After this, we began to look with more attention to all that we found. One day with my friend Alejandro Alvarez, a, almost by an accident found Hoyo Negro, this is a place that was mentioned by Mr. Bacheron. We found there a relative species to mammoths and elephants. And we also found a female 
bones and also a uh, sable tooth. And this way we can see how all these materials were kept for many, many years. We began a voyage that began thousands of years ago with megafauna that no longer exists and also with human beings. And this began a career or a race that has not stopped. This is the wheel of the world that is still turning. And now I am going to jump in time and I'll show you this picture that is also of Pleistocenic megafauna. And in this place, there were not just mammoths and all the animals from that time, but we also found Pleistocenic bears remains, and we found many animals dating from these times. Now we have 19 remains of these animals, 19 documentations. Now I want to go right into the Maya culture, the ancient Mayas that used these sites and these pre-Hispanic caves. For them, all of all these caves were sacred without minding if they got sweet water from them or they had any practical use for them. All of these caves were sacred and this is one unique characteristic that the Maya aquifer represented in all its aspects. And this is the sacred character that these caves had for the ancient Mayas. And this is why we can find all sorts of materials of archeological materials like offerings on the bottom of these caves. Most of these remains are in an extraordinary well state of preservation. We found semi-precious stones. We are archaeologists and we need this material evidence to understand our world and to interpret and to feel and to know what we find, but also the symbolic aspect is very important and we cannot leave it aside. In this sense, I want to tell you that through our work and the work of Dr. Brady that began with, who began with this discipline, he has taken, this work has taken us to notice and to realize that all these remains, these old places are associated to caves. In some cases, like Chichen Itza, of which we're going to speak later, this relation is very clear. The pattern of settlement has been noticed, and we have noticed that this has been linked to caves and some of the archaeological, uh, architectonic structures were built on caves and cenotes and we will soon have more information about this. The archeological material is very important, which is the one that helps us to determine a temporality. And for many colleagues, there has been a sort of fascination for the artifacts and they have left aside the concept of the cave. But we need to ask ourselves, why are these artifacts in the caves? This is the most important because this is what can take us to understand in a deeper way the relationship between men and caves. If we also consider that for ancient Mayas, life came from a cave. The first couple came out from a cave. So it is very important to find these materials in very good state of conservation inside caves. But what is important is to understand why caves are so important and why caves have been, have served as receptacles for all these 
materials and we need to understand the link between humans and deities and how these communication channels are open through the caves. This way we need to understand the occidental thought about sacred and profane, which is a sort of vulgarization when we try to understand the context given by the caves. Here we find the sacred cenote of Chichen Itza, which is for excellency the most important cenote and one of the most famous. Many of you have heard or read about this. This is the place of the offerings of human sacrifices. We know that we have recovered more than 300 human remains, most of them of children. But this has vulgarized a little bit. And there is a difference saying that this one was sacred, but the others are not. But it's not true. They Some ideas arose saying that all other places were used like for laundries, but it's not true there are still ceremonies practiced today where Shmen Om, the men who have the knowledge and they make sacred celebrations praying for rain. And this has been made for thousands of years and they still make invocations in all the caves of the surroundings asking for rain because if they don't do it that way, it would be an offense for the deities in all the caves. And there is a strong evidence in Chichen Itza, which was not only the place where seed water was taken, but it was a sacred place with an important temple on the shore. There is an artificial cave, which was excavated by ancient Mayas with the purpose of obtain, obtaining materials, but at the same time with the purpose of having a cave, a sacred place that could exacerbate the ritual character of that place. And this is a place for worshipping the deities of the underworld and for the cave. We find this not only in Shtolok, but in all the caves in the surroundings. This is found in the municipality of Hoktun in Yucatan, where we can find the only sacred path or Sakbe, which was the name that ancient Mayas gave to these roads that joined physically and spiritually different places. These paths were used to walk on them to practice economic exchanges, but also had ritual character. And they were also used to reinforce the position of a site or a place. And we found and we find this Akve, a white road or path beneath the cave an underground sacbe that leads to a cenote. And when we dived in the cenote, we found that this cave communicated to another one, which probably was, was digged or was visited by ancient Mayas during drought times. And thanks to those droughts, we could discover that these caves had been explored by ancient Mayas. And these droughts fostered the creation of these paths. We also see a large interaction between caves. There is a modification of the caves. We can see the construction of walls the delimitation of spaces, some of them are wonderful, and this meant a great effort. We can't imagine how ancient Mayas built this, and some of them are also very beautiful. And this speaks about the interactions given there. 
We believe that these caves were not used for dwelling. These caves were visited by ancient Mayas and they were worshipped. They were temples and they interacted with these caves and they entered and came out protected by rituality. They also did a series of constructions in these caves like this one, where you can see a wall, a wall that is limiting two holes. And we can see an entrance through which one had to crawl to get into the second hall of this place. And besides that, once entering to the second, we can see in this area a hidden shrine. This is a cave that is very difficult to enter to. And the ancient Mayas built that temple. We are still investigating the reasons and they modified the cave. Some other places like this, which is a hole with an easier entrance that was blocked making that one needs to enter crawling and it probably had to do with the ritual or symbolic aspect as also occurs in this other place with dr brady we have worked in the site of chichen itza where we have found uh, some mines of saskav saskav is this white soil which was very important this scav was important for building, for construction. We have entered and we have found very interesting situations. For example, this Sascadera was artificially built with walls delimiting something. We have not excavated these walls. This was discovered during our last stage of work. But after the problem of 2020, we have not been back, but we will soon go. But this is an example of how an artificial cave can become a sacred aspect, protecting in a certain way the entrance to something that is sacred. We also find here very beautiful representations as this one in the south of Yucatan in the area of Puk, where we can see a jaguar and a deer and also a bird. And I think this is a mural, but you can see the scale here. And this mural painting measures three times three meters. And this is um, an evidence of the interaction of men with the caves. And this was probably the result of having obtained a benefit from the deities inhabiting the cave. There is another site in this cenote where we found the remains of a structure, a pyramidal structure, even with hieroglyphs. And this was reported in 2004. And there we also wrote an article, we published it in the magazine Archaeology. And this is very interesting because we noted how we have gone through paleontology we have gone through the Maya period to the colonial period where the Spaniards are trying to impose the new religion. And with this, some haciendas came. This is a very notable hacienda in ruins and has a small access in a pond for water, which resulted to be one of the most important places with archaeological remains, human remains. In one of our research, we could get rid of the version here that some of the narrations in document histories dating from the colonial period from the 16th century were false, but we confirmed that there are human bone remains where history says that there was were still human sacrifices in the 16th century. And here we find pre-Hispanic remains clearly defined 
And here we see the teeth mutilation according to the Maya tradition of the vital Maya teeth deformation. We also found some elements related to sacrificing actions, sacrificing by crucifixion. As the Chronicles say, we found these bones associated to a beam, probably a crucifix, which has suffered decay. And this has also helped us to understand Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza had to be the starting point of the study of cenotes, because this cenote joined through this path to the main construction in Chichen Itza, the castle, is somehow iconical. It's not just iconical, but from that path and all underground areas and from the cenote, some of the most diverse offerings came out. Some of the most important found in the Maya area, even some golden or metal works, which is Tumbaga, it's an alloy. And some of them were pure gold, jade. They worked gum. And we found very rich offerings. And of course, the most important offering was the remains, was the human remains. I had the privilege to investigate these bones of the Mexican collection obtained by Dr. Roman Piña Chan in the year 60s. And we could understand that they had, that not only living people had been thrown to the cenote, but also some who have suffered cops and so probably could have been fled. And some of the remains were from children between 11 and 13 years. And Chichen Itza is still a starting point in order to know this. Dr. Jim Brady, as co-director of our project, we have been working many of the caves and we have been revising many of them as Calabanche, where we have found more elements than we thought that could exist there. Here we see Dr. Brady working. And we are going to watch a video that illustrates the works that we are undertaking now in Chichen Itza. Es mi amigo Cory Jaskolski, tecnólogo del equipo, y esta es la parte más divertida de nuestro trabajo, sin duda. This is the funniest part of our work, with no doubt. The opportunity to dive in this sacred cenote, where we didn't see anything. But thanks to a scanner, we could understand that, it, that there is a large cavern from north to south. It means in direction to the castle, which can give us an idea that maybe the castle can have a cenote beyond it that could be linked with this other cenote. As you can see, there's no visibility in the water. And we could only use a sonar, we could only we can see the caves, but we couldn't interact. There was no visibility. 
and it was very difficult to be in an underground cave but we always take some samples of water in order to evaluate the quality and the great maya aquifer has given life along the centuries another example is this magnificent cenote with very clear water And this space, more than pretty, was very important for our work. This light entrance in a certain way could have been manipulated because the cave has been modified. It's a perfect square facing northeast and the light enters during the zenithal passing of the sun during the months of May and August. There is also an incredible offering. We found a lot of elements deposited on a platform that we believe that was dry in the 10th century of our era. And the ceramics found there, that is a human skull. But the ceramic founder coincides with the temporality set there. And there was a large amount of charcoal found. We also found the spines of different fish, which were used for sacrifices for ceremonies begging for rains and in these times of the senatal passing were very important and this was used as an observatory in the same way it's used in Xochicalco. It was used for astronomical calculations but in a water environment. Here we see all the light captured here. This is the Holtun cenote in Chichen Itza. This cenote could also be part of a cosmogram because if we remember the studies of the, all the settlements is west is to the west of the main facade of the Castillo in Chichen Itza. On the north, we find the cenote, and we found a cosmogram with all these cenotes. And our colleague René studied with electro with some electronical devices to so we could figure out that there were underground connections linked to the sacred place of Jaash where the sacred with the sacred nature holding the cosmos was born. In this Holtun Cenote, we were surprised to find in the bottom an image of Tlaloc, the god of the water from the center of for central part of Mexico. And when we revised the cave of Palancanche, we also noticed that there were other images of this god Tlaloc. And when we were lucky to find a cave in another study, called Balamku, the cave of the sacred Jawar, which was a very difficult cave, difficult to enter. We were looking for an underground line of water to link the other cenotes that below the castle. And by accident, we discovered that magnificent cave. That cave has been discovered almost 60 years before by a boy. 
And it's important to clear that because it was thought that the archeologist Victor Segovia discovered this cave and it was a mistake. This was discovered by a boy, 12 year old boy named Esteban. Now he was a 60, 70 year old man and he remembered everything, all his task of discovering this cave. He, his father and his brothers gave notice to the INA center when he discovered that. And the archeologist Segovia intervened then, but after the discovery, Segovia arrived to the place and he decided to seal the cave again. The Mayas had sealed it years before, but the archeologist also decided to seal it. And the cave remained closed for 60 years, for 60 years, something that helped to its preservation. But the cave refused to be forgotten. And in a cup of luck, we rediscovered this cave of Balamco. We will also soon give notice of this task of Esteban Mason, and we're going to publish it. But let me show you another video that shows how difficult it was to enter into this cave. And I want to stress that without the help of our Maya colleagues who helped us in this site, it would be impossible to take this work. And being respectful of, respectful of the Maya oral tradition that has nurtured our work, the ethnographic part of this is very important. And we always make ceremonies asking for permission in this cave, something that we are glad to make always. And we are going to show a video where you can see part of this ceremony. We are in a very sacred place of the sacred cenote. This place is extraordinary. And now we need to make a fine documentation, protection and conservation of this wonderful and unique place. Okay, the effort was worth it. This is a beautiful cave. There is very few oxygen, but this has also helped to the preservation of these elements. It's very important, the material aspect of the artifacts, which is what is providing us with the information. And what the caves tell us, caves give us lots of data. 
they can give us the date where a site began and the day and the date when these places or sites ended. And here we found many elements in a regular state of conservation, like these incense pots with the shape of Tlaloc. This makes us ask ourselves, what is a foreign god making in this Maya sacred area, which is a cave? But it's also interesting to understand that if we understand this cave, we will have the first information about the beginnings or the outset of this place and also the end. Some of these objects are broken, maybe in a desacralization act or maybe in a certain kill, ritual killing of the objects, which was practiced. This still needs to be investigated and we are analyzing some fragments of ceramics and we have also analyzed some contents of the incense pots and at least there were 200 years between one incensary and another in two specific cases taken randomly. What else can this cave tell us? I am sure that many more things, and we are still waiting to go back to the field, something that is going to happen very soon, fortunately. The world situation uh, has not allowed us, but we will go soon. We are still making efforts with this multi multidisciplinary team of anthropologists, archeologists, and a friend of us, an artist, also joined because we know how important drawing is for archaeology, the human appreciation of an element, and also how to be able to interpret it in a drawing. We were gratefully surprised by having my dear friend Fernando Aceves working in this site. He insisted in getting into the cave, and I tried to scare him saying that there was no oxygen, it was very hard, but he insisted. And he insisted in getting into the cave and painting these objects. The result was wonderful. And it was reason of an exposition at the castle of Chapultepec in the National Museum of History of Mexico, which was very successful. Part of his work is incredible. And this human part, this interpretation of the elements through the eyes of an artist is not just beautiful and aesthetical, but it also reveals some details, many details. Also looking at a representation of our working team in the cave is very exciting. And we are very thankful with our dear friend Fernando because having done this work, pioneer in these Maya caves, and we look forward to continue doing many more. Almost to end with this presentation, let me introduce you a cave, and I am showing it today because we are making a great effort of conservation, a great effort of conservation, and part of our project is the digital preservation project. That is to say, we want to preserve digitally all the elements, caves, and everything we see in the caves, foreseeing their possible destruction, something that we expect that will not occur, but we are making all our efforts and we need to have an insurance. Because thanks to the members of our team, we are trying to preserve and we are registering all this. This cave was worked by our project in 2007 and reported in our technical report to the INA in that same year. In this cave, we registered 137 hands, most of them children's hands. 
we can't explain the reason of these hands, these handprints. We cannot determine why these handprints of children are located in this cave, even in the sailing. So we scanned this cave and we have achieved one of our best digitalization works. And let me show you this also very short video, but I think it's worthy because it's like a diving without water inside a cave, the cave of the Las Manitas or of the little hands in Yucatan. This digitation work was made some years ago. In a moment, we are going to change to 3D and we are going to start flying inside the cave. Get like 25 things in that money danger. <laughs> Here, we practically begin to fly in the cave. And the interesting of this is that it makes our work easier. And it also give, uh, gives us tools. With a click of my mouse, I can measure at the same time all these hands that are present in the cave, or most of them, or at least all that all those we are looking at. And we can have a comparative chart. And all of them corresponded to hand prints of children. We can have the measure of the handprint, which is possible with this technology, and we can make a comparative study with present day children, something that is going to give us a pattern of the measure of hands of children and youths. Well, just finishing to continue with questions and answers, I would like to tell you that this is a great team, a great team formed by archaeologists, anthropologists, oceanographers, explorers, biologists, hydrogeologists. We have the support of many institutions, UNAM, University of the Caribe, the Center of Investigation, Scientific Research of Yucatan, and some others. We have a, we are a big family of investigation, making a great effort, having great supports, which must be mentioned, National Geographic, the Swiss government, which is supporting us with the digitation words, works, the Andean Commission, and the sole project. We are still looking for more ways to obtain funds and in order to continue working. Now I'm finishing with this slide. And through an initiative of the INA director, Dr. Diego Prieto, and of the Dr. Jose Francisco Sanchez Nava, coordinator of archeology, span we are working to integrate a file so that the great Maya aquifer in, various, in some specific ways can be considered as a mixed world heritage site. This contains the sweet water, which is the life resource. And as you saw in a small sample of the cultural heritage this contains, we have, depending on this aquifer, a large population of animals, manglars, birds, mammals, and different animals. This water goes to the reefs and it's important to consider that we are still working with the world heritage direction of INA with Master Luz de Lourdes, Herbert. And I need to say it's a honor to be part of this colloquium with Cambodia. It's a honor 
And I would like him to be with us today, archaeologist Kento Padi. I know his work on the caves of the bridges, and it seems to me as a, a, an exemplary work of archaeology in caves. I think that we can achieve that these great countries can have a collaboration that with, will undoubtedly be of benefit for the preservation of the cultural heritage of our peoples. Thank you very much for your attention and I am at your orders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Archaeologist Guillermo de Anda for this brilliant presentation on the Maya Aquifer with all these discoveries that are very valuable, all the registers which are so precise and it's incredible for all of us to try to understand through all these materials. We are going to continue with the questions and the answers. We have a question from Gustavo Gomez. Gustavo is asking to archaeologist Anda, how can the cenotes in the Maya area be preserved? Can they be considered as our architectural or archaeological sites? Yes, these were sites where there was human interaction very early. The first settlers in America were there, and there has been a formation of these sites. It's an immense archaeological site underwater, and these are archaeological sites with human interaction, something that is wonderful. These have been subject to many theories and interpretations which were not accurate, but now with this new way of exploring the caves, we are discovering this great importance, the importance that these underwater sites have. There is a comment from Helen Jarvis. Thank you to Helen Jarvis, who was present in all the conferences and the comment is what a magical and masterful presentation. This was not premeditated, but this is a magical question. I don't know if Fernando Aceves would like to make another comment or to pose a question. Uh, because as archaeologist De Anda mentioned, there are works of Fernando Aceves in this research, so we would like to hear from his experience. Francesco Siqueiro said, is asking that inside the investigation, is there a rescue of the rituals? Yes, this is something we need to rescue. This is very important to rescue all the oral tradition and the tradition of the rituals because they teach us very much and it's part of the intangible heritage contained in these sites.
and also let's remember how Alfredo Lopez Austin has mentioned this intangible heritage and the recovery of ethnological data, which is very important to understand the past. It's like a source of information. Yes, that's a classical work that needs to be studied. Now, Fernando, we would like to hear you. I had the chance to make Fernando an interview where he spoke about this opportunity of diving into these caves and entering in these dry caves and all the technical process of the drawings, even drawing with very few oxygen. Yes, we had to try different materials because oil smells much and I was allowed to enter in the cave twice or three times, I don't remember. But on the first time I was not allowed to take my cell phone and I started with a headache because they thought that maybe they will have to drag me out of the cave because there was no oxygen. But the experience of being painting in a place that had not been open and listening to the talks of archeologists is an experience that I will keep all my life in my mind. And I am very thankful. And also the quality of the drawings is incredible. Yes, I agree. This is an extraordinary work. We are very glad to have this documentation made from an artist. We have a quest, a comment. Well, we never know that there are vestiges underground. We assume there are because we knew that these places were sacred and represented a great part of the Maya universe. And so we deducted that there would be a link with the deities. And for example, if you ask, how did we know that the caves were dry because it's evident that at 10 meters where the elements are found, they could not have been deposited with such a good care and with the intentionality so far from the entrance in a fortitious way because there is no water flow that could have taken the object. So it would have been impossible that the pieces could have been deposited there. So we know that people must have entered to the cave and to have left all the objects there. Yes, there are many, and we have noticed that ancient Mayas like that complication. There is a relationship of difficulty to consider a place as more sacred. I can't imagine ancient Mayas. For example, if it's difficult for us to enter with few oxygen, we have 
oxygen, we have all the equipment. I can't imagine how these ancient Mayas, almost, almost naked, just carrying a torch and all the incense pots in order to leave it as an offering, being so careful to avoid this incensory to be broken. It means a huge task with lots of devotion. And we found that in dry and in dry caves and also in wet caves, fluted caves. Is it salt water or sweet water? In most of the contexts where we have dived, these are sweet, this is sweet water. But in other sites, we have found salt water, which floats. And the difference of density of the waters makes that these don't get mixed. And we dive to a certain deepness, maybe 50 or 60 meters without touching the salt water layer. In some sites like Quintana Roo, where we are closer to the coast, we see there the salt water is there. And it also makes us having a view as if there was oil in the water. And it's amazing. It's hallucinating. But most of the time, the water with which we interact is sweet water, unless we are in a certain deepness. Yes, the dating of Balampu, we are working on it. It was published in the Arqueología Mexicana magazine. We have a dating corresponding to 800, 820 more or less. And in some others who are newer with a difference of two, hundred years, some date from the eighth or ninth century. So it's something surprising for us. We need to practice more analysis. And this is part of the proposal of the archaeology in Maya caves. And we have a comment from Cynthia from the Embassy of Mexico in Vietnam. And this is also to support Mexicans in Asia. Thank you very much to Dr. Guillermo de Anda for his passionate intervention. My question will be focused on the international cooperation for development. Which are the substantive elements that you see as those with more interest for a collaboration in the future between specialists of Cambodia and Mexico? That's very in interesting. We can make a very good exchange between Cambodia and Mexico. We, both countries have, a, have many caves. We have been working for many years with flooded caves. We have methodology and techniques and what I have seen from archeologists in caves. I was mentioning at the beginning in Cambodia, it is an extraordinary work in a similar context And this exchange can be of benefit for both countries. And this could be very important and especially for students because students can have a different view of the work field in both countries. There was a mistake, the embassy Cynthia is from the Embassy of Mexico in Thailand. Uh, congratulations for Dr. De Anda. There is another comment. It's something very interesting to see how 
all the how the communities can can be incorporated to this investigation in archaeology. Thank you very much to Frederic Vacheron for stressing that point. This is something very interesting for us. No, this has not been considered in the cave of Bantu because it's very difficult to enter to the cave. Now with these uh, instances giving economic support for the excavation, we, would, we expect to have copies of these caves and we expect to have reproductions with physical reproductions of the caves and of the objects to present to the public to prevent them getting into risks when trying to get into the caves and also to safeguard the heritage. In the case of Balanco, it's not thought to open it to the public. We would like you to visit us as a researcher and we would like to invite you, but as a scientist. Yes, in many places, there are copies of the original World Heritage Sites as those that we find in Lascaux in France. These are identical copies that have been created to prevent entering into the original site. And also in the south of France, there is an entrance through the water to the original site, something which is impossible. So it was decided to create a replica of the cave. And also for the Chauvet Grot, which was found 30 years ago, and our replica is also being built. And this will have all the technological resources to recreate the ambience and the volume as the place is. And we would like to certainly have an example like this with this cave. And yes, that's the idea. We have to have a reproduction of the site in order to present it to the public, having all the resources and also Altamira in Spain has the same replica of the site. Dr. Keria Sung also wants to congratulate Dr. Guillermo de Anda for his very interesting presentation. Son Fakti is also también pregunta. We are working with the Swiss government and National Geographic because it's thought to make an extension of this site in the Geographic Museum and in another museum in Switzerland, in the Museum of Anthropology and in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico. And now I would love to have to take this to Cambodia. Some of these sites are the Fortun Cenote that you saw, the Campujung Cenote, the Yashva cenote and three other cenotes that we are investigating.
Uh, for those who are following now the transmission, this is the Archaeología Mexicana magazine that we were mentioning that Dr. Guillermo de Anda mentioned, and there is also a digital version of the magazine. And it's uh, very accessible, it has a very accessible price, and you can download the articles with the explorations performed in the Maja region. And uh, through these works, you can know about all the research works of Dr. De Anda. Now we are going to ask Fernando Aceves Humana. Uh, I was asked to show the magazine again. We are also going to ask Dr. Keria Sung to turn her camera on and her microphone just to give the final words to this colloquium in a formal way. And here you can see the magazine. This is the number 156, which is the corresponding to the Great Maya Aquifer. Dear Fernando, Dr. Keria Sun. And now it's your turn, please, to give some words. Uh, buenas noches a todos los amigos mexicanos. Good evening he, to all our Mexican friends. He preparado algunas I have palabras prepared some words en español in Spanish para los amigos mexicanos. for our Mexican friends. Uh, me gustaría agradecer a todos los organizas, I would like to thank to all the organizers, mexicanos, all the Mexican y, organizers, and in, parti in particular a Fernando. And in particular to Fernando. En estos tiempos difíciles para la salud mundial. In these difficult times for the world, world's health. Pudimos mantenernos en contacto. We could keep in touch or in contact. Pero sobre todo, fortal. But especially, leyendo, we could strengthen nuestras relaciones a través de esta conferencia. Our bonds and relationships through these conferences. Espero que esta primera iniciativa I look forward that this first initiative sea seguida por otras. can be followed by others. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much to all of you. I must say that this would have not been possible without the help of Madame Chao Sung Keria, to whom I am very thankful for all the passion and support that she put on bringing our countries together in the field of archaeology. Without her effort, this would not have been possible. And we thank her for trusting us, really, with all my heart. Uh, I would like to add in English. Uh, I would like to thank agregar you. In English y agradecer. For all presentation from both a parties todas las presentaciones for, uh, de los dos from Mexico países and Cambodia de México y Cambodia and for sure for all the uh, Mexican authorities and, y también a todas las autoridades mexicanas and especially to thank our minister Dr. Fung Sakona to be y present. Y especialmente agradecemos a nuestra ministra Fung Sakona. Thank you so much, minister, with my Muchas respect. gracias, señora embajadora, por su apoyo.
Thank you very much, Kerya, and everyone. Muchas here. gracias. So a Kerya y a todos. We close this presentation with the intervention of Dr. Guillermo de Anda, which was very brilliant. And there is also a team who made possible all this transmission. And Fernando, uh, please continue. <laughs> you are the Mexican head of this part, so please. I would also like to talk a little bit about how this, one moment, please. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you, la buena impresión arose after a collaborative work with the Royal University of Fine Arts in Fontaine to collaborate and recover the academic levels lost by the civil wars and genocide. The intention was good and in Cambodia, they gave us their friendship and we were welcomed. In 2011, the Char Rufa workshop arose, which turned out to be the first metal engraving workshop in the history of the country and initiating the Department of Graphic Arts in the Faculty of Fine Arts, thanks to the support of the then rector, Dr. Bong Sobat So Chenda, director of the Faculty of Arts and our great friend, Professor Chan Vitarin. Since then, 12 Mexican and foreign volunteer artists offered intensive courses, training more than 70 students and teachers as printers. This experience prompted us to do the same for the benefit of young people in our country. The Taller La Buena Impresión was born in 2019, thanks to Julie Gerbaud and Patrick Debron, former professor of the National School of Fine, Fine Arts in Paris, who donated us their wonderful 199 boring electric lithography press boring. La Buena Impresión is formed by Francisco Castro Leñero, Daniel Barraza, Dr. Lacra, Daniel Flores, Adriana Viña, Maria Miranda, and myself, it's a professional lithography workshop and school where we train artists and printers, sharing the excitement for the visual arts among young people from rural communities. Our goal is to capture talents and help them in their training to give them the projection they deserve. Additionally, the social service programs give them pleasant experiences of being community teachers. Teaching 10 students by a semester last year benefited 268 young people from different regions of the state of Oaxaca. We implemented the same strategy in communities near archaeological sites to help revalue their unique environment for the next generations. This vocational motivation we offer in both countries is not limited to the field of visual art. It encompasses other areas of knowledge and seeks to raise awareness about the need to protect cultural and natural heritage by encouraging young people to dedicate their lives to visual arts, archaeology, or restoration. I admire the work of archaeologists and restorers. Thanks to them, I have witnessed the play of light in the vestiges of great cities or offering spirit for centuries or that have been veiled in caves and that are just coming to light. When artists were the eyes of archaeological expeditions and printing presses spread the findings to the public and hence the idea of holding an archaeological colloquium. I am moved by the extraordinary work to unveil our heritage, the understanding of our origin and share it everywhere. Southern Mexico and Cambodia share similar soils, climate and flora. Therefore, the same challenges of excavation, analysis, consolidation and conservation of materials. We were fortunate to meet Chao Sunkeri, advisor of the Apsara National Authority. Thanks to her invaluable help and tireless enthusiasm, she managed together with Professor Azedin Beshaush to bring together institutions that were born from the good intention of safeguarding and disseminating the historical heritage of all. The National Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico and the Apsara National Authority in Cambodia. 
the efforts of the Mexican ambassador in Vietnam, then concurrent with Cambodia, Pancho Lopez from INA World Heritage Direction, Pedro Francisco Sanchez Nava from the National Coordination of INA Monuments, and Dr. Nelly Robles allowed the signing of the Memorandum of Mutual Understanding that opened the possibility to promote the proposal of Professor Beshaur, direct the representative of the Director General of UNESCO during the peace accords and advisor of the Apsara National Authority. Bibliographic exchanges, exhibition and of archaeological pieces and the common subject on archaeology and environment focused on the field work with a degree in both countries is a proposal that Mexico for excavating, investigating and consolidating these works by financing researchers and Cambodian workers. Hopefully there will be academic and student exchanges that allow others to live experiences like ours. Cambodia has taught us very much about gratitude to life and love. I have no more word, but the words of gratitude for Dr. Prung Sakona, Minister of Culture, for Pablo Rafael de la Madrid in representation of the Secretary of Culture, Alejandra Frausto, for Mr. Hank Peo, Director of the National Apsara Authority, for Mr. Puticar, Director of the National Authority of Preavigea, to Pedro Francisco Sanchez Nava, Director of Archaeology of the INA, to Dr. Kerry Asun, Advisor of the National Apsar Authority, who helped us a lot with this project, to Dr. Federico Pacheron, representative of UNESCO, to the, represent, to the rector of the University of Fine Arts. We have a deep love for your university, to Ulises Rendon, Director of Media of TV INA, to the BBVA Foundation of Mexico, to Nian Sochat, Chief of the Academic Affairs, Seun Sopat, from the Faculty of Archaeology, to Chan Vitarin, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts, to Bertrand Lovejoie, Conductor of the program of tonight from the UDEM, to Sergio Gomez Chavez, Director of the Project Ciudad de Tlalocan, Dr. Nelly Robles of Monte Albán and Datsompa, to archaeologist Kim Sotin, Deputy Director of the National Absar Authority, to archaeologist Pem Sam Eung, Director of Monument and Archaeology of the National Absar Authority, to Raul Barrera, the archaeologist, for the, his works of urban archaeology, to archaeologist Dr. Adarit, Deputy Director of Conservation of Monuments of the Angkor Park, to Jareli Jaidar, Doctor in Sciences of Materials, Specialist in Rescues in the Archaeological Vestiges in Maya Area, Dr. Q Chan, for Director of Projects of the National Apsara Association and of the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, to Dr. Guillermo de Anda, that gave us today this excellent presentation to Marcela Acosta, thanks to whom today we can hear and communicate. Thank you to Kema Un for his translation, for Mariela Contreras, who did an extraordinary work coordinating the presentations, Bernardo Porras, editor, Gustavo, Gustavo Gomez, Pilar Cabrera, Pilar Jiménez from Cultura en Bicicleta, Francisco Siqueiros, Ulises Leiva, Media Director, Ana Galicia Zamora, Director of Communication, Ana Luisa López del Valle, Chief of the TV Department and Communication of the INA, Sergio García, our friend Gabriel, and to all our colleagues of La Buena Impresión, Daniel Barraza, Dr. Lacra, Daniel Barraza, Maria Miranda, Francisco Castro Leñero. Thank you very much to all of you. We are going to ask our friends from Cambodia to turn their cameras on, please. To our friends from...
Thank you to all those colleagues that did possible to have this, the transmission of this colleague. Thank you to Keria Sun. Please uh, turn your cameras on, Maria too, please. People from the project of Guillermo de Anda. Kyu Chan. Gustavo Gomez. <laughs> 